welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in this e seminar organized by the CARD Working Group of European Renal Association. My name is Arzu Velioğlu. I'm a transplant nephrologist at Marmara University Hospital, um, and I'm a board member of the CARD Working Group. Uh, I'm going to moderate this e seminar today. We will discuss a very important topic of transplant evaluation process. Uh, which is entitled uh, Current Perspective uh, on Cardiac Screening for Transplant Kidney Transplant Candidates. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce faculty. Our speaker of today is Dr. Eilish Nemo. Um, she's a nephrologist in, uh, at Edinburgh University in the United Kingdom. Uh, she has epidemiological and clinical uh, experiences on uh, cardiovascular disease in kidney transplantation. And we have also two distinguished uh, panelists, Professor uh, Clemens Budde from Germany. Uh, he is a, a head of clinical transplant program uh, in Charity University. He is the author of more than uh, 300 journal articles on kidney transplantation. He obviously, he has uh, more, much more uh, experiences uh, on the field. And uh, another other uh, panelist is uh, G Professor Gabriel Onisko. Uh, he's a transplant surgeon, currently works at uh, Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And uh, he is president elect of uh, the European Society of Organ Transplantation. Uh, I have a brief reminder for audience. Uh, by participating in this e seminar, uh, you can earn one credit for medical education. Uh, for this uh, and uh, receive a diploma, you have to complete the survey, uh, which will uh, send you end of this uh, e-seminar. This is only for ERA members. If you have questions uh, to speakers or panelists, uh, you can write uh, your questions in QA function on the screen. And also, uh, this is the first time uh, the ERA is launching a real-time translation uh, with uh, using uh, artificial intelligence in seven languages, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, uh, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. Please note that this is a pilot test uh, and uh, we apologize uh, for any mistakes in translations. Uh, this will be improved uh, uh, for other uh, e-seminars. You can find uh, the, your language at uh, the bottom of the screen. Well, um, we can start. Uh, uh, we already know that cardiovascular diseases uh, most is more, more most important reason uh, for mortality in wasted patients and um, kidney transplant recipients in recent years, and there has been a controversy uh, about the limits of cardiac screening. And uh, can we prevent cardiovascular events uh, in wasted patients uh, and uh, after transplantation? And can we improve uh, cardiovascular outcomes with cardiac doing cardiac screening um, in this population? Now, uh, Dr. Eilish Nemo uh, going to talk about uh, this topic uh, in line with uh, the current evidence uh, on the literature. Uh, Eilish, floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Eilish. I'm a final year renal trainee in Scotland. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, I'm still a trainee, so I might have slightly less direct clinical experience of this topic than some of the other panellists, but hope I'll be able to provide a comprehensive overview of this area in the next half an hour or so. So I'm going to try and provide an overview of our workup for kidney transplantation in asymptomatic patients. And I'm really going to focus on coronary heart disease, thinking about ischemic cardiac events over the next half an hour. Obviously, there's lots of other elements of cardiac risk in terms of valvular heart disease and heart failure, but we don't really have the capacity to cover all of that today. So what I'm going to go over is a bit about the rationale of why we might want to perform a cardiac assessment before we list our patients for transplantation and talk about the principles of screening. I'll then review some of the evidence on the non-invasive investigations that we currently use to assess patients' cardiac risk. Talk a little bit about interventions which we might have to aim to modify patients' cardiac risk, both whilst they're on the waiting list and in the peritransplant period. I'll talk a bit about current approaches to cardiac assessment. And finally, I'll make some suggestions for reasonable clinical practice changes just towards the end of the talk. <clears throat> 
So starting off by talking about the rationale of cardiac assessment. Um, I'm sure everybody on this um, kind of webinar will be familiar with the survival benefit of kidney transplantation to remaining on dialysis for many patients who have got kidney failure. So this is the results from a meta-analysis that was published a couple of years ago, looking at 18 observational studies. And it showed that there is a significant benefit of um, transplant with respect to survival with a hazard ratio of 0.45. And I think it's just worth highlighting this and keeping this in mind at this point in time, because I'm going to talk about the cardiac risk in the peritransplant period. But I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that for many of our patients, transplant is the best treatment we have to improve their long term survival. And so we should really be trying to focus on optimizing and enabling transplant for as many patients as we can who might benefit from this as a treatment option. So although transplant improves patients' longer-term cardiac survival, there is an increased risk of cardiovascular events for around three months after kidney transplantation. And it's been estimated that it takes until about eight months post-transplant for patients to start to achieve the survival benefit. And that's come from a couple of these seminal papers that are actually about 20 and 25 years old now. And that concept of increased risk in the peritransplant period is probably not sur um, surprising when we consider that nearly half of our asymptomatic patients with kidney failure have actually got underlying coronary artery disease. And quite a high proportion of these will have the most significant triple vessel or left main stem disease. And this is just a slightly more recent study looking at patients who received their first kidney transplant in the US up until 2011. And it's just to highlight that the leading cause of mortality in the early post-transplant -trans period, post period remains cardiac events. So I think for these reasons, it seems intuitively correct for us to want to try and risk stratify patients before we list them for a transplant. That's because it can help us provide prognostic information for the individual, which can help guide kind of informed decision making and help people know about their individual personalized level of risk. It might allow us to facilitate intervention on coronary lesions to try and optimize patients' cardiac status and reduce their peritransplant cardiovascular risk. And finally, it might help us identify those high risk candidates who may not benefit from kidney transplantation. And that's also important in making sure that we make equitable use of our finite donor organ pool. And through the course of this talk, I hope to cover whether the cardiac screening investigations that we currently use actually support this risk stratification process. So the principles of screening have been kind of laid out by the World Health Organization uh, back in 1968, and they really focus around trying to identify a group of people who have an early asymptomatic or pre-disease state, which can be picked up and have treatment targeted to them to try and improve their long-term outcomes. So there are kind of 10 principles I've put here, but some of them include the condition being screened for being an important health problem. We should have a test that is acceptable to the population being targeted. There should be a latent or an early symptomatic stage of the disease, and there should be an accepted treatment. So if we try and apply this to the process of cardiac workup before kidney transplantation, we should have tests that can identify um, coronary artery disease before patients become symptomatic. Patients who have got asymptomatic coronary artery disease would presumably have a higher risk of peritransplant cardiac events. We should have an intervention that can improve our patients' outcomes. The benefits of undergoing screening should outweigh the risks. And very importantly, in our current climate, we should um, have a cost-effective approach here. So what we're trying to identify is patients in this kind of green and yellow stage of this diagram before they start developing cardiac symptoms or irreversible cardiac damage. So what about the cardi cardiac investigations that we currently commonly use for screening? So there's a range of different investigations that can be used that will vary between different centers and between different countries. I'm not going to talk about ECGs because I think everybody would probably agree that patients should have an ECG before they're listed for transplant. And I'm not going to talk about a resting transthoracic echocardiogram because I think this can give a lot of information on things like valve function and um, heart failure, which are obviously very important for patients' overall global cardiovascular risk out with of identifying any ischemic uh, pathology. But I'll talk about um, these tests that I've highlighted here, which are probably the ones that are most frequently performed at the moment. 
Um, so first of all, talking about exercise tolerance tests, this is probably the most simple investigation where a patient is attached to an ECG monitor and exercises on a treadmill at increasing speed and incline um, and have their ECG tracings monitored to look for ischemic changes. So for an exercise tolerance test to be diagnostic, patients need to achieve a heart rate that's 85% of their maximum predicted. And if we think about our patients with kidney failure, I think it's not surprising that many of these patients actually fail to reach this because they might be limited by fatigue or claudication. And our patients have also got a high prevalence of baseline ECG abnormalities, which can make detecting changes more challenging. So for these reasons, diagnostic results are actually reported in under 40% of potential transplant candidates. And you might therefore question whether this is a kind of effective or an efficient use of resources. Saying that the ability to complete an exercise tolerance test is associated with survival in patients who are considered for transplant and those who are waitlisted. Although some might argue that we could make a more simplistic assessment of that just in the outpatient clinic. Um, so I'll now talk about myocardial perfusion scans and stress echoes, which are probably the most frequently performed investigations at the moment. So this is results from a systematic review and meta-analysis, which we're looking to see how well these investigations can identify um, coronary artery stenosis of more than 70% picked up at an invasive coronary angiogram. And this is in patients that are being considered for kidney transplantation. So at the top here, there are 13 studies um, looking at stress echo, which have been analyzed. And there was a pooled sensitivity here of 0.76 and a pooled specificity of 0.88. And the myocardial perfusion scans at the bottom here, there were nine studies and overall the sensitivity and specificity were similar. So a pooled sensitivity of 0.67 and a pooled specificity of 0.77. So essentially, you don't need to remember those numbers, but it's just to say that these investigations are probably not going to identify all patients who have got occlusive coronary artery disease and might pick up some patients who don't have occlusive lesions. Saying that, however, myocardial perfusion scan results will still have a prognostic significance, so they can still identify patients who are at an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events or MACE and overall survival. And even mild perfusion abnormalities, which take up less than 10% of the myocardium, can still be associated with increased mortality. And there's a nice uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that was published back in 2015, which estimated that for every 100 patients who have got an abnormal myocardial perfusion scan, an additional 20 will experience MACE compared to those individuals who have got a normal test. So for stress echo, the results are probably relatively similar. Um, some individuals will like a stress echo because it will give both a structural and a functional evaluation of the heart in one test and doesn't involve the, um, any radiation exposure. Patients generally get given medications to increase their myocardial workload, and this can result in hypertension or arrhythmias, which can sometimes be a limiting factor. But despite that, stress echo um, has been reported as being as good at coronary angiography at predicting cardiovascular mortality and MACE. And the same systematic review meta-analysis that I mentioned on the previous slide has estimated that for every 100 patients with an abnormal stress echo, an additional 24 patients um, will experience MACE compared to those individuals with a normal test. So a CT coronary angiogram is probably the slightly more, um, newer investigation that might be used for coronary artery disease screening. Previously, there might have been concerns that it provided anatomical rather than kind of functional information about patient's cardiac function. There can be concerns about the risk of contrast associated acute kidney injury, especially in patients who are being worked up for transplantation preemptively. And there might have been limited radiological experience with it. It does, however, have a very good sensitivity of 0.96 for detecting angiographically proven coronary artery disease. And this high sensitivity has resulted in an increased interest in the use of this test, because it would be thought that a normal test might be able to offer us reassurance. Uh, so this is just one example of a study looking at CT coronary angiograms, which was a multi-centre study in kidney transplant candidates. They looked at 138 patients who had at least one additional risk factor, and they underwent a CT coronary angiogram in addition to a myocardial perfusion scan and invasive coronary angiogram. 
They didn't have any patients who needed to start dialysis that was considered to be due to contrast nephropathy. And they reported that CTCA predicted death and cardiac events. So it might be an alternative to stress imaging tests. And finally, just going to mention the coronary artery calcium score, which is another test that has been used more recently. Essentially, coronary artery calcium is essentially kind of pathognomonic of underlying atherosclerosis, and it can be graded from a non-contrast CT scan based on the number and density of calcium deposits. So this is a study that was published last year that looked at just over 500 potential kidney transplant recipients. And they looked at patients' risk factors, their coronary artery calcium score, their CTCA results, and they followed them up for major adverse cardiac events. And they found that MACE was predicted by the presence of three or more risk factors, but also a raised coronary artery calcium score of more than 400, and the presence of multiple vessel stenoses or left main stem disease on the CT coronary angiogram. And so they suggested that there might be an additional value of using these techniques in addition to using risk factors alone. Um, I don't think we've got enough information at the moment to really make any kind of broad comments about the use of other biomarkers to assess cardiac risk. But I think this is an area that we will get more information from in the next couple of years. And um, we're certainly locally looking at whether cardiac biomarkers like troponin, pro-BMP, CK or CRP taken at the point of transplant assessment might be able to identify patients at an increased risk of peritransplant events, or perhaps identify a low risk cohort of patients who don't need more aggressive investigation before their listing. And it's possible that in the future, we might be able to think about other biomarkers as risk stratification tools. So what about kind of real world data looking at the impacts of cardiac screening? So I'm going to just talk about two studies, one in the UK and then one in the US. Um, so this was work we did in the UK looking at patients who received a kidney transplant between 2011 and 2017. And we looked to see whether patients had undergone any form of screening investigation before they were listed. So that could be a perfusion scan, a stress echo, a CT coronary angio or an invasive angiogram. And the first thing to note was that there was a huge variation in practice between different centres. So between 5% up to 100% of kidney transplant recipients had been screened before the point of listing. And essentially, we were able to capitalise on the fact that there was this large variation in practice to create two groups of individuals who we thought would have a similar baseline level of cardiac risk. Um, who had differences in their screening modalities before listing that predominantly therefore existed due to differences in practice between the transplant centre which they were worked up at. So we looked at just over 1,700 patients, 10% of them had diabetes and around 4% of them had a history of heart disease um, prior to listing. We then followed them up uh, post-transplant and looked at their instance of cardiac events, and we didn't find any difference between the two groups at 90 days, one year or five years post-transplant, suggesting that for patients who reach the point of getting a kidney transplant, undergoing a screening test doesn't change their outcomes. You should just note in this um, analysis, however, that the highest risk patients are most likely to be screened regardless of which centre they're worked up at, so they aren't included in this analysis and those results can't be directly extrapolated to them. And this is a similar type of study that was done in the US. Um, they looked at a much larger cohort of patients, nearly 80,000 patients who received their first kidney transplant between 2000 and 2014. And these are low risk patients, which was defined as being under the age of 60, not having diabetes and not having a history of heart disease. So they used a, a technique called an instrumental variable analysis, which is another way that we can try and kind of infer causality from an observational study and essentially also capitalizes on the fact that there are different screening practices between different transplant centers. So rather than analysing patients based on whether they underwent a screening test on an individual person level, they analyse patients based on the transplant centre that they um, are worked up at, which can kind of be thought of as a kind of randomization variable. And similarly, they found that there was no association between undergoing a screening investigation with one year of transplant and death or acute MI within 30 days of the transplant procedure.
So I just want to put a few of these numbers into perspective because I've talked about patients receiving a kidney transplant, but that's obviously just a proportion of those who we begin the assessment process on. So overall, around 15 to 20 percent of patients who begin transplant assessment do not get subsequently listed. But the proportion of these who are precluded due to an abnormal cardiac screening test is probably much smaller, somewhere between 0.5 and 4%. And that's because the decisions about listing are often multifactorial and not based purely on a cardiac screening test. Of those patients who get listed, um, around 5% will die before they're transplanted and cardiovascular disease is the most frequent cause of death. And a further 5% might get delisted before they're transplanted, although the reasons for that are not clearly defined. It's also estimated that between about 10 and 15% of patients will have an MI within three years of being on the waiting list. And I think these two studies that I've described at the end suggest that based on this observational data, there isn't an association between undergoing a non-invasive screening test and having a post-transplant cardiac event. And I just want to highlight that, of course, there are potential risks that might be related to screening. I've mentioned contrast nephropathy already, but these tests use up healthcare resource, um, patients can be exposed to radiation, and there can also be delays to listing. So this um, graph is from a study done in the UK, which showed that patients take around four months longer to be waitlisted if they have an abnormal stress test compared to if they had a normal investigation. And that might not sound very long, but I suppose for some patients, it might be the difference between being transplanted preemptively versus on dialysis. So for some individuals, that might have a clinical impact on their journey. OK, so what about interventions to optimise patients' cardiac outcomes? So I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the ischemia CKD trial, and this is probably the biggest study that we have that tells us about the use of coronary revascularization in patients with kidney disease. So ischemia CKD looked at 777 patients who had um, an EGFR below 30, had stable cardiac symptoms, and had moderate to severe ischemia on a cardiac stress test. And they randomly allocated them either to a conservative strategy of receiving optimal medical therapy alone or an invasive strategy, which involved optimal medical therapy with coronary um, angiography with or without revascularization. And they followed patients up for all cause mortality and non-fatal myocardial infarction. It's important to say that this wasn't in the context of surgery, um, but they found that there was no difference between the two groups in terms of the primary outcome, and that included no difference in subgroups of patients who had diabetes or who were on dialysis at baseline. And importantly, they also found that the invasive strategy was associated with a higher incidence of stroke and a higher incidence of death or initiation of dialysis, which just shows that um, coronary angiography isn't a benign procedure. So not all of these patients were transplant listed, 194 of them were, and the group has subsequently gone on to do an analysis specifically in this cohort of patients, which again showed that there was no association with undergoing the invasive strategy and the primary outcome of mortality and non-fatal MI. Um, I think these graphs are worth looking at though. So on the right here, we've got our patients who were in the wait listed group. And the blue lines represent those patients who are allocated to the conservative strategy. And you'll see that by three years, probably nearly half of patients in the conservative approach had actually undergone an angiogram, and probably nearly 20% of them had been revascularized. And that's probably around double of the overall cohort, which maybe just suggests that as a group of clinicians, we still have some reservations or anxieties around putting patients forward for transplant who may not have been um, kind of thoroughly optimized or investigated, whatever that may mean. So what about optimal medical therapy? So there isn't much information about what optimal medical therapy is in the perioperative period for patients who have got kidney disease. Um, if you want to look at studies in more detail, there's a really nice summary of them in the supplementary material of this AHA statement, which was published in 2022. But in patients not selected for kidney disease, generally the advice is that patients should continue beta blockers if they've been started at least a week before surgery, because this might reduce the risk of arrhythmia and MI in the perioperative period. 
Patients on aspirin should continue this if their risk of MI is greater than the risk of bleeding. And patients on statins should generally continue these, though there's no evidence to the support the sort of short-term use of perioperative statin use to reduce peri uh, perioperative um, cardiovascular risk. And in terms of RAS inhibitors, these should generally be restarted as soon as it's feasible after the operation. Now, obviously, for our patients with kidney failure, medication responses are not the same as general populations. We know that with statins, as kidney function declines, the relative risk reduction for coronary events conferred by statins falls. Um, and no difference has been seen in patients that are waitlisted versus non-waitlisted patients with respect to any benefit from statin therapy. I'm not going to go through all of these kind of antihypertensive um, studies, but again, there's very limited evidence on what optimal antihypertensive use is in patients who have got kidney failure. There may be some selective benefit to use of beta blockers in patients who are on dialysis who have got increased sympathetic activity but we don't have firm evidence of what blood pressure targets should be in our cohort of patients. So in terms of optimal medical therapy and ischemia CKD, they focused on discussing lifestyle factors with patients. So smoking cessation, physical activity and diet modification. Um, in terms of medications, bearing in mind that these are patients who have got moderate to severe ischemia on a stress test, they should have been on aspirin or clopidogrel, RAS blockers with any other antihypertensive to achieve a systolic blood pressure of below 130. Beta blockers if they had a history of MI or reduced cardiac contractility. And they should have been on the maximum tolerated dose of a statin with the use of azetamibe if they still had a raised cholesterol. So in ischemia CKD, it obviously showed that optimal medical therapy was non-inferior to the invasive approach. But the contribution of each of these different treatment components isn't known, and we need to do further work to try and understand what optimal medical therapy involves. And it's worth also just saying that in ischemia CKD, um, at the end of follow-up, a third of patients hadn't reached the blood pressure target, and about half of patients hadn't reached the cholesterol targets. So even in that very kind of defined controlled trial situation, it was difficult to achieve the targets that they set out to do. So what does cardiac assessment currently entail? So usually at the moment, it involves some form of non-invasive cardiac investigation. Some centers might refer our patients to cardiology or anesthetics for a specific review. And some places might have a cardiorenal multidisciplinary meeting, which can provide oversight of um, the cardiac protocols, provide selected reviews of the highest risk patients and provide kind of outreach and advice to referring centers. There are a number of different guidelines which all cover cardiac assessment before transplant. Um, I've just shown the KDIGO guidelines, which were published in 2020 here, which still recommend that candidates at high risk of cardiac events should be screened to help guide medical management and inform their risk. But they don't recommend excluding candidates from as with asymptomatic coronary artery disease from transplantation based on the presence of that alone. The guidelines, however, don't have any consensus on what combination of risk factors should trigger patients to have screening, what first line screening investigations should be used, and if patients have got a positive stress test, what further management should subsequently be undertaken. Um, in the UK, currently, we're probably screening about 50% of our transplant recipients before listing. But applying populations to these different guidelines, the proportion of patients requiring a screening ranges from 20% up to 100%. So you can imagine that there's still a large number of patients that were investigating pre-transplant. This just shows results from a survey that we did in the UK a couple of years ago, where we asked each transplant centre to tell us what risk factors they used to identify patients for further investigation. And I think it won't be surprising to see that most centres are now using a risk stratified approach um, and that patients are generally selected for screening based on the presence of previous ischemic heart disease, diabetes, increased age and abnormalities on an ECG or their echocardiogram. But I think it's important to try and capture um, additive cardiovascular risk. So, um, the, this is a kind of looking at indicators for cardiac investigation prior to transplant listing. 
And the orange bars here represent risk factors that if present in combination, would encourage clinicians to screen a patient before listing. So that includes things like a raised BMI, um, smoking history, reduced exercise tolerance, um, and longer duration of end-stage kidney disease. And I think this is where it's quite difficult to kind of clearly define what risk factors we're interested in. There are a number of formal risk indices that can be used. Um, so here I've just shown the Newcastle Risk Index, which is used by some of the centres in the UK, and also the Duke Activity Status Index. Um, and some centres will use these to try and identify patients who might need further investigation or to aid counselling. If you want to look at a kind of formal kind of guideline in terms of um, a set out of how to investigate patients. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but again, the paper by Cheng et al, which was published in 2022 in AHA, provides quite a nice suggested summary. And here they've split patients into a low risk group um, who don't require any further cardiac testing. Patients who might have the presence of certain risk factors that can follow a non-invasive pathway. And those patients who are most worried about in terms of, for example, regional wall motion abnormalities on echo or low ejection fraction, who might benefit from a direct to cardiology referral um, and consideration of more invasive approaches. So how does cardiac assessment guide patient management? I think I've mentioned that coronary intervention hasn't been shown to improve outcomes in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. But identifying patients at higher risk of cardiac events might help us have informed decision making discussions with our patients, help us consider lifestyle factors and really look at patients' medical therapy. And also when we spoke to different clinicians involved in transplant in the UK, they do adapt their perioperative management of these higher risk patients, which might include increased intraoperative invasive monitoring, planning patients to be looked after in high dependency or intensive care and having a lower tolerance of post-operative hypotension. And others have also commented that it's important that we have done enough investigation and workup for patients to try and avoid operations being cancelled on the day of transplant, which might be relevant for patients coming in in the night time where the teams on call might be less familiar with patients in this setting and making sure that we're still accountable to patients and their families and to clinical governance structures. So I'll say there are ongoing challenges in this area. I've talked a lot about high risk patients, but we don't have a definition of how much risk is too much and who the right person to assess that is. I've talked a lot about MACE and cardiac events, but it's very difficult to know what is a kind of true type one myocardial infarction versus a kind of supply and demand mismatch. We don't know how best to quantify additive risk, and we don't know what other techniques we might be able to use in the future to try and help stratify patients. And then going back just to my first slide right at the very beginning, should we really be trying to change our mindset to be thinking of transplant as a form of revascularization in itself? So finally, where should we go from here? If we refer back to those initial principles of screening, I think we've shown that many kidney transplant candidates with coronary artery disease have no symptoms and abnormal screening tests can help identify patients at risk of cardiac events. But we don't have great evidence in terms of what interventions might improve outcomes. We don't know where the balance of risk and benefit lies and we don't know whether this approach is currently cost effective. Uh, we've spent a bit of time thinking about whether a randomized control trial to examine this would be possible, but I think it would be very challenging because patients would need to be identified very early at the point that they're being considered for transplant listing, um, and that's long before they might actually be listed and subsequently transplanted. So the follow-up times would need to be very long, um, and this previous study had estimated that around 4,000 patients might need to be recruited to a trial to detect a 20% reduction in MACE, which is obviously a kind of massive undertaking. Saying that there is a study that's currently recruiting called CARSC, which is looking at a slightly different question, which is relating to repeated screening investigations for patients that are already on the transplant waiting list, rather than screening at the point of uh, transplant listing. And they've randomized patients to undergo no further screening versus the current screening standard at regular intervals. 
They're aiming to enroll just over 3,300 patients and they're about halfway there at the moment. And I think the results from this study might well um, kind of whet people's appetite with whether we should be making further changes at other parts of the transplant assessment process. And finally, I just want to talk about the patient perspective, which I think hasn't been well captured in many of the studies that have been looked at to date. Um, this is just a statement from a patient from one of our conferences in the UK who was talking about his perspective of peritransplant risk. And he just said, if I was offered it as percentages, if the risk was 10%, then I'm afraid I would take it. I've been in an unpleasant state, uh, state at times, and you take an opportunity like that when you're in that situation. I used to be quite active and it does restrict your ability to get about with the enthusiasm as you did. In my case, if I was given a percentage of 10%, I would have snapped off my nephrologist's hand. So obviously we don't want to, can't take this in isolation, but I think it's just important to note that we don't have a great overview at the moment of what patients' perspectives on this situation is. So I hope I've been able to show that transplant candidates have got a high pretest probability of having underlying coronary artery disease, but the current non-invasive tests that we currently use might have insufficient sensitivity and specificity to actually identify patients with coronary artery disease, and their use hasn't um, been shown to improve outcomes in patients who reach the point of transplant. There aren't any contemporary randomized studies which examine if pre-transplant intervention improves outcomes in the context of surgery. And it's important that we try and continue to balance our good post-transplant outcomes, but with a shortened um, evaluation process. I think we probably need to change our mindset um, more to how we can use assessment as a way of optimizing or enabling transplant for patients. From a centre perspective, I think it's important to about think about what resources you have available and what things you can do in a timely fashion. And finally, our highest risk patients can still benefit from transplant. And so we need to ensure that we make equitable use of our resources, but we don't want to ration treatment. And multidisciplinary involvement is likely going to be key in this area going forwards. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to the people that have helped me with some of this work along the way. Um, and I'll just stop sharing my screen now and come back for questions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eilish Nimo, for enlightening us uh, on the very important topic. And it was uh, your presentation uh, is really concise and extensive. And uh, when have expert panelists and uh, I would like to ask them and uh, would you uh, make some comments and uh, would you say um, something about the, your practice, current practice uh, about cardiac screening pre-transplant? Uh, Clemens, please. Yeah, thanks, Eilish. Uh, really fantastic talk and you really touched down on all the important aspects. Uh, and also the psychology uh, behind it. And I think at the end of the day, we and the surgeons are afraid to have a patient dying on the operating room, uh, in the operating room. I think this is uh, the, the catastrophe uh, we, we want to avoid. But again, I, I can tell you uh, the last, I think two patients we had with this kind of catastrophe the day after transplant or so, uh, these were patients who basically said, okay, I did not tell the doctor because I was afraid if I would tell him that I got angina, I would he would not have operated me. Uh, so I think this is also the psychology of our patients. We also have to in, take into account and it really makes it difficult. And I don't know really a good answer, except again, the, what you showed is that the risk of perioperative uh, mortality is low. It's a few percent of myocardial infarction. I think this may be kind of is reassuring that we are doing not so bad. Uh, and um, again, also myocardial infarction can be treated and, and uh, most of the time can be treated. Um, but of course, this kind of events are very, get very deep into our brain and we really want to avoid this. And this may be of our psychology explains it that we are maybe over afraid of accepting patients. I think this is maybe one aspect here. Um, and I think it's needed to have an evidence-based approach as you point out. And I think 
the idea to have this kind of risk stratification as, as proposed by the American Heart uh, and, and in circulation to have patients in three categories is kind of what, what we do uh, is to have these low risk patients, this 35 year old patient with Alport disease and, and having no long history of kidney disease, you can of course transplant him without any big uh, issues. And then this 65 year old diabetic patients uh, which is completely a different class. So I think this is kind of this risk stratification. Again, whether you have a classifier or so, I think it's not really important. It's, uh, and I like this algorithm. And also I like your statement that we need an echo in the beginning and an ECG and an history of the patient. I think this is very important. And I think then we have already a good uh, a, a, a rationale for further uh, investigations or for just uh, accepting the patient for the wait list. But I can tell you that 20 years ago, we already made a survey in, in, in Europe asking whether centers are performing an echo. And only 44% of patients uh, centers performing an echo in all patients. Yeah, you can say maybe this was, uh, they didn't perform an echo in, in Alport patients, okay. Uh, but I think, and you pointed out, an echo is is kind of a must. Uh, I would agree, uh, but obviously, it I think it's maybe not on all centers, and and we have to look also at the resources and and the availability of 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 those investigations. So our approach is again to have this kind of risk gratification, and then uh, go from here. Uh, basically, according to this algorithm, which was proposed. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, what is the surgeon aspect on this issue? The Gabriel, would thank you, you Arju. Uh, yeah, um, first your... of all, Eli's fantastic, uh, fantastic overview of of the field, and, and it struck me that. Um, despite so many papers and so many studies, we still have no got a, we have not got a clue of what the best way forward is. I think the surgeon's view is pretty much as as uh, Clement said, it's not about dying on the table. It's also about misusing a, a very scarce resource. And what I mean by that is you're putting in a patient that doesn't have the outcome and patient die with a functioning graft. So we we we, we do not achieve the best outcome long term from the kidney. I think one of some of the things that struck me from your presentation are first of all the variation in practice in terms of access to the cardiac investigations because that is an important point. Um, let's say we come up with a definitive one; not everyone may have access to it, so we need to rethink the how we design the services around that investigation. And I think from there comes the fact that we have not got a uniform approach to to the strategy of way forward. The second point was the lack of relationship with the post-transplant outcome. And that raises an important question. Are we super selective in, in the patients who move forward from the waiting list to transplant, as we've shown before? And therefore, whatever we do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. Um, or are, are we severely risk adverse? It's exactly what Clements was saying there. And we, we do not take patients despite being on the list because we think they're diabetic, they're higher risk, and so on. But with that comes an important question, which perhaps you didn't touch, is what type of kidney we do. You mentioned that clinicians choose better kidney, but herein may lie the problem because we put kidneys that are likely to work better, straightforward, is low DGF. And those by definition are, are um, the low risk kidneys. So are we doing the right thing, putting the low risk kidney in, in these patients? But maybe the point forward uh, is living donation because this is one place where you can actually optimize the risk to a certain extent. Um, there is a different type of kidney altogether. Um, and, and then it doesn't put the pressure on the national resource. So maybe the higher risk patients should be encouraged to find their own donors because that's a much better way of doing it. And finally, the point which was interesting is um, I don't think it's any point in doing anything before they go on the list. And I think the study you showed um, raises an interesting point, which I noted down during your talk. I'm talking about the ischemia CKD patients study that actually we start investigations once they're on the list and after two or three years, which means that, of course, we are all worried about the cumulative effective dialysis on the cardiovascular risk factors, but also we're starting to pick things up there. And one thing that we need to do, and hopefully the second study you presented will address this question, is what's the correlation of those uh, investigations on the list with the outcome post-transplant, because that we don't have. So I think that's an important point to address the question, because then we, we begin 
thing to see light. Whatever strategy for testing we do, if, if we start testing after a couple of years on the waiting list, which by definition would be on dialysis, maybe that's a group we need to focus on if there is a correlation with a poorer post-transplant outcome. But I think at the moment, the evidence is not there to support any of the strategies. And I think what you showed, it's an intuitively uh, reasonable approach to try and say, right, we stratify by what we think are the risk factors um, and, and gather the data. And that brings me to my last point, which is no big study will be able to achieve this. These are complex studies to do. And you showed the numbers, 4,000, 3,500 patients, very difficult. The alternative is they're all registry data because we can put this together and really bring big numbers that we can then put in, in a model, perhaps AI model and whatever, there we can come up with the, the a definitive answer. Um, but clearly I think we're not there and we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Aish, would you comment further on this? Yeah, I think they're all really important points. Um, and I'll kind of just mention a couple of them briefly. So I think, Clemens, you just mentioned kind of echo and the importance of maybe having that as a sort of standard test for most patients. I know certainly in some places locally, it's still very difficult to get echo. There's very long waiting times. And I think we still have to be sensible about, you know, making sure that we're using these resources for the patients that are most likely to benefit. So, you know, your 25 year old with reflux nephropathy um, who's being preemptively worked up, you know, I think we can probably be quite reassured by someone who has not got other risk factors, who hopefully has got a good functional status. But it's really hard because there's not a kind of clear definition of like when someone crosses over that bridge from being low risk to medium risk or medium risk to high risk. And it's completely unevidence based. But when we've done some survey kind of work in the UK, there's people who kind of mention that, you know, actually, if patients have undergone kind of big vascular access procedures or other operations, they might class as some kind of like assessment of their cardiac fitness and sort of ability to cope with that cardiac stress. Um, patient, I know some people will walk with their patients up and down their clinic corridors to try and make an assessment of their exercise capacity in that setting. And it's really hard because they're such subjective features that we're using but actually may be no worse than some of the tests that we've got we just don't know um I think the a lot of the difficulty is that um we don't know if we're being too cautious at the moment and whether we're not transplanting some patients who might still benefit but it's very difficult to think how you're going to show that without doing some of these bigger studies or trials, unless there's a kind of more global change in our um, attitude to how we manage these patients. Um, and probably that needs to happen on a kind of larger scale rather than an individual scale, because you're, you've are you got to have your surgeon, your anesthetist, your nephrologist, all of these people need to be happy with the patients that we're putting forwards. Um, and there is some variation, I think, in how these different groups view risk and you know that we've all got slightly different kind of visions that we need to align um and I think the live donation versus deceased donation topic is a really interesting one as well you know I think that we would probably all agree that if you had a high risk patient who had a live donor and you could do this in the middle of the day with a couple of surgeons um with a planned post-operative bed and that they would you know that would be excellent wouldn't it that's definitely the best situation but I suppose it comes back to some kind of the kind of ethical questions about whether you can assess people in different ways based on their ability of having a live donor and you know I, I think it's a really interesting thing about whether we divide our acceptability criteria I mean certainly some patients will be deemed acceptable for a live donor kidney only, won't they, in the basis of their overall risk. But I think it's probably quite a challenging area to discuss with patients. Yeah, I think the point is on the live donor, and this is also a question here in the, from the audience, is uh, what is the, 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 the live donor? Basically, it's a question of waiting time. And the question, uh, there are two questions again. Do you do rescreening after a certain time on dialysis? And uh, the other point is the waiting time. Uh, how long gets your waiting time longer if you do some uh, interventions or uh, uh, or what is the delay in listing? Uh, 
if you do this cardiac screening, but you mentioned it, I guess. Uh, there was one slide, I think you said there is kind of a harm for screening and you prolong the listing, right? Yeah, that's the only study that I'm aware of that has tried to kind of quantify um, things by time scale. So that was just whether patients had an abnormality on a um, stress test. So it was kind of four months longer to be waitlisted. It, I don't think from memory, and I could be wrong on this, but I don't think they mentioned how many patients had the test and then were subsequently excluded from transplant based on that alone. Um but, you know, I think we're probably talking about several months. And if patients subsequently undergo kind of uh, revascularization, which, you know, certainly locally our practice is changing away from that based on the ischemia CKD study results. And, um, you know, if patients end up on dual antiplatelet, then we're going to probably end up talking about much longer periods that patients are delayed for because we're not going to want to transplant them until they're back on probably aspirin alone. Um, so if we get to that point, we're probably talking about, you know, six to nine months. And that's if you manage to get your angiogram done straight away. Uh, and Elish, if I may, I think herein lies the problem because we're extending six to nine months on dialysis, which would have a detrimental impact on the outcome without necessarily gaining much in terms of uh, further identifying the risk of of, uh, of patients. So the question on the on in the in the chat whether we should uh, recommend a particular time uh, screening after uh, starting dialysis is difficult to to quantify. So the practical approach would just be to say, well, if you identify uh, high risk patients, sort of traffic light them and then review them in the clinic, which may or may not necessarily trigger further investigations, but a clinical review with patients will will guide your assessment whether you you need additional investigations or not and maybe that's that's a sensible compromise between between the two yeah i think so because that will also give you i mean really what we're trying to do is i suppose you're trying to pick up on subtle symptoms and things that might have moved them from being asymptomatic to symptomatic when you're probably going to have a different approach for how you assess these patients um and yeah, I guess that's probably a good kind of in-between situation. You know, I suppose this is where the KARSK study will hopefully give us information about whether repeated screening is going to be beneficial. Um, and it's difficult as well because some patients, you know, will be transplanted within two years, but the difference of maybe being transplanted within one to two years versus those patients who are on the waiting list for five, six, seven years is going to be quite different. Um, just to, to mention the KARSK study, so we are participating and. Uh, I tell the patients it's not screening versus no screening. It's screening by uh, by uh, by uh, by uh, different methods versus clinical screening. Uh, so because we ask the patient, do you have angina or so? So it's a it's a, a question whether you do mechanical screening uh, or clinical screening and history taking and. Uh, uh, maybe subtle uh, uh, history taking is definitely as good as 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 some uh, myocardial scintigrams or stress uh, echoes. The problem, of course, is that it's also sometimes difficult to have the. You need good doctors for this, yeah. And uh, good doctors is also a, a scarce uh, a phenomenon, maybe nowadays. So uh, in the time uh, constraints and so on. So I think this is, I think, an interesting question whether uh, we could find out by, by screening, just asking patients uh, versus doing some inter interventions and uh, so on. Yeah, I think that's like the key way to going forwards. And I do wonder if that's where some of the centers that have kind of well-functioning cardio-renal multidisciplinary meetings where you can put, you know, people with real interest and expertise in this area together to really pick out those patients who you need to focus the um, time and investigation on and identify the ones where you can be relatively reassured that they're still hopefully okay or continue with your current sort of trajectory for them. Elish, can I pick you up on one particular investigation, which you kind of um, skip quite quickly over because a lot, there is lack of evidence, and maybe that's uh, aligned with one of the questions, which are the novel investigations. What do you think about cardiopulmonary exercise test? Um, so it, it has shown some some good correlations with outcome, uh, particularly for for uh, high risk surgery. 
Um, as you know, we've used it in liver transplant uh, a fair bit, and we're beginning to kind of include it in a in a composite index of risk assessment rather than just being the yes or no. Um, it has a role in pancreas transplant, which are of course much more difficult patients and much higher risk of cardiovascular events. But where are we standing with this in the in the world of renal transplant alone? So I have to slide on that, and then I took it out in the interests of time. Um, but I mean, there is, there is evidence, sort of some of the CPEX obviously gives a huge array of different parameters and can give a much kind of comprehensive overview of patients' functional abilities. And it definitely can be predictive of risk of cardiac events. I suppose a lot of what I've been thinking about doing a lot of this is how um much kind of resource a lot of these investigations take up and I suppose CPEX is really at one end of that um in terms of um time and you know anesthetic input and um you know so on so I suppose it might be another test that we could include in the ones that might provide some information but I don't know if it's really shown to be any better than the other investigations that we're using and comes at the expense of more time and and cost, which I think are the things that we should really be trying to make sure we're, you know, keeping our cost utility as one of our key priorities here. So I'm not sure, maybe for selected patients, it's a very useful thing to do. But I think those patients probably need to be selected by a, a specific kind of cardio renal or anesthetic renal group to try and identify who might actually benefit from that rather than trying to do that more frequently. So my colleague used to ask the patient to come with him uh, the stairway and take one staircase up and then see whether they can follow him and uh, <laughs> if not follow him into his office, they were excluded from the waitlist, which is a very cost effective way, maybe, um, but of course it's not very objective and this is maybe the problem. Um, uh, what do you think about troponin? You mentioned it in, in this uh, um, uh, box plots and, and so on. What do you think about this? Would this be maybe a potential way to increase uh, our uh, specificity and sensitivity? Um, so I think probably ask again in like a year, maybe. Um, so is, you're doing a study on this, huh? So it's, it's one of my colleagues is doing some work on this. And I think you know, I, I guess with the hope of it probably is that it might help us identify a group of lower risk patients, I think is really where this kind of thing might come in. Um, we were kind of surprised at the moment that actually um, troponin is quite discriminatory in that I think many people would presume that all of our patients will have a high troponin at the point of transplant assessment. But we actually do see that there is a wide range in troponin levels and it, I suppose where I see that it might have some use in future is identifying a lower risk group of patients who you can be reassured by um, without needing to put through further testing. But that's all work in progress from one of my colleagues. So. Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, yeah, our time almost running uh, over. And um, thank you very much. Uh, all uh, very successful. Uh, joining us and uh, uh, if I uh, state a closing remark and uh, I should say and I uh, uh, if summarize the all we talk and uh, we should do uh, the basic cardiac investigations including electrocardiography and echocardiography in all um, candidates uh, but in symptomatic cases and the, the cases with uh, the high risk factors uh, the, the uh, exercise uh, Stress test may be reserved uh, for this kind of patients, not for uh, asymptomatic cases. Um, and in light of uh, ischemia SCAD trial and the um, invasive approach, uh, revascularization and standing in asymptomatic patients is still debated. And and uh, yeah, uh, if we do a uh, strong uh, uh, recommendation it's not possible right now uh, but we 
still recommend optimal goal-directed medical therapies in, in our cases. And the, uh, each transplant center, uh, they may create multidisciplinary teams, including cardiologists and anesthesiologists. And by the way, we can improve our patient outcomes um, I believe. Thank you very much, uh, uh, all attendees, uh, all audience, uh, panelists, our speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, I uh, thank you again and uh, have a pleasant day. Have a pleasant uh, evening. Thank you very much.